So it's great to see so many uh, of you in this meeting here. This uh, is kind of the first time that we try this with these new technical capabilities that come up. Uh, but I think this is a very promising way to assemble people without having to pay and without having anybody going in an airplane and uh, releasing CO2 into the air. So uh, this is the first seminar for the Rift and Drifted Margins uh, online meeting. And uh, you can think of this as a bit like an EGU AGU session, only in this very small version and every two weeks. And, um, and uh, so this is, uh, has, a, has a few simple rules. Uh, similar to EGU sessions, we will have a few short talks and we will have uh, time for questions afterwards. If you are in a meeting uh, at EGU, you won't talk, so please unmute your microphone if you uh, haven't done so, and then the speaker won't, won't hear you. And if you want to ask a question after the talk, you have this chat option you see down here, and then you can type in your question and uh, we will give you the word after the talk, or we will uh, come back to your questions after all talks are finished in the final uh, discussion round. I also pressed the record button, so hopefully my computer records the entire meeting and then we will upload it later on for those people that are in unfavorable time zones and sleeping now. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Mike Kendall for the first talk and he will be speaking about seismic evidence for magma assisted drifting. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Just let me get on to my talk here. Okay, thank you. Um, I normally would say it's nice to see everyone, but I can't see anybody. So uh, anyway, um, thank you everybody for showing up. Um, it's been an interesting session. What I'm gonna talk about really is a review of work that uh, myself and many, many colleagues have done looking at uh, seismic methods for looking for evidence of magma assisted drifting in, in Ethiopia. Um, there's a list of names here, which isn't by any means complete, uh, but there's two groups I'd really like to point out uh, who, without their um, intellectual collaboration and, and help, we would not, I would not have any results to present to you. And those are our colleagues from Addis Ababa University, uh, Atle and Elias and colleagues from the Eritrean Institute of Technology, Gabriel Rahan and uh, Berhe. But as I said, uh, many, many people contributed to what I'll show here. I'm gonna concentrate on seismic, so I'm not gonna talk about other methods and primarily the mantle, although I'll touch a little bit about on, on, on crustal um, effects too. Um, essentially, continental rifting is a really fundamental component of plate tectonics, and it's really one of the more enigmatic uh, parts of plate, te plate tectonics. If you look at a uh, textbook from 20, 30 years ago, you get this sort of picture where in response to distant forces, the uh, plate is, is pulled apart, uh, mantle upwells, uh, heats the region, and you get strain distributed over very, very uh, broad areas. Um, and so really when we started these sort of uh, experiments, this work, it was really what sort of seismic methods can we use to address these, this, this question? Can we see evidence for this? Um, this is uh, a now well often seen picture of how Africa is rifting. It, eventually with time, the Somalian plate will rift away from the Nubian, just as the Arabian has rifted away from the uh, Nubian. And what we now realize is it's actually the mantle that's playing the, the key role in this. It's not the distant forces, and it's really radial and horizontal tractions at the base of the, of the mantle, but even more important, uh, the effects of Africa's dramatic dynamic topography and associated uh, gravitational potential energy. Um, nevertheless, even when you do a, 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 a force inventory, uh, it's still less than that needed to break the cold continental lithosphere. And in a really um, seminal paper by Roger Buck in 2004, he pointed out with the, the more conventional stretching model, the yield stresses, the, the forces needed to really break these cold that kind of list are really high, more than is, is available by, by orders of magnitude. And what he argued is if you get uh, melt injection, perhaps along pre-existing weaknesses or topographic highs, it reduces the yield stress by order of magnitude. So what I'm gonna show to you is really how seismic methods have helped provide evidence of this. 
So back again, if you go back to the 90s, there's effectively two seismic stations working in the Horn of Africa, one in Djibouti, a geoscope station, and then one uh, near Addis Ababa. And since that time, well over 200 stations have been deployed throughout the entire region. And I'm sure I've forgotten some now. So it's really changed our view of what this region is like. So this is kind of a summary of what I'm going to show you very quickly. It's a real whistle, -top, whistle stop tour. Um, basically, tomography has given us really unprecedented images of the mountain in this region, showing really sharp, sharp sided plate boundaries. We see evidence for very high BPVS ratios that can only be explained by melt from both tomography and receiver functions. Very sharp changes in crustal and lithospheric structure uh, as evidence from receiver functions. And then evidence for aligned melt pockets or sheets of melt that uh, um, uh, manifest themselves as very strong seismic anisotropy. And the new work I'm going to show at the end is some work we've been doing recently on attenuation anisotropy. So again, if you go back to sort of a, a global model when basically it was just the data, data from the two seismic stations, this is one of the um, global shear wave models at a depth of 75 kilometers. You'd think, yes, there's good evidence for a plume below our far. It looks very clear there's a low velocity zone in this area. But with all the deployments and the seismic stations increasing the coverage, it's like we've now got a much sharpened picture of what rifting looks like in the mantle. And you can see low velocity shear velocities here that delineate the rift and even sharp sort of left turns, right turns following the manifestation of rifting on the surface and even low velocity channels that go underneath the anomalously high Ethiopian plateau. So really quite a different uh, picture. And there's been a lot of studies now, I can't reference them all, but from surface waves and body waves on a range of scales, we see pretty clear evidence for, for uh, focused seismic anomalies in the top 150 kilometers that lie on top of a broad sheet-like low velocity anomaly. Um, and these, these um, um, localized anomalies cut or puncture up through the, the Pan-African fabric. Uh, if we want to look at the more of the stratigraphy, we can use receiver functions. So what we're doing here is looking at how seismic energy converts at boundaries from either a P wave to an S wave or an S wave to a P wave. And this allows us to map the depth of the moho, the thickness of the crust, and also its average VPVS ratio. But equally, we can use S to P conversions to look at conversions from the lithosphere, cenosphere boundary. And so this is a, a paper by um, um, James Hammond, and it sort of shows the really dramatic variation you get in crustal thickness across the Ethiopian plateau, where it's here greater than 40 kilometers, and then it drops in the main Ethiopian rift to sort of less than 30, 25, and then gets down as thin as 15 kilometers in the northern reaches of Afar. So a very, very sharp transition as you roll into the rift, which is not really consistent with these, these stretching models and is more consistent with the magma system models. Here's just a, a, an example using a, a technique known as common conversion point migration, where you use dense arrays of the stations and you can map the structures along a profile like here. And you can see almost 40 kilometer thick crust beneath the Simeon Mountains and then a drop to 20 and then even 15 as you move into a far over very, very short length scales. The other thing, as I mentioned, you get out of BPVS ratios. And so under the plateau, they're sort of what we call more normal, maybe slightly high, but under a far, they're in places well over two. And the only way you can explain that is with partial melt. And this is a, a map from the same paper of the BPVS ratio. As you can see all the red spots in the rift and all the bluer spots towards the edge and really how anomalous these BP ratios are compared to other um, sort of more conventional terrains. Similarly, we can look at the base of the plate, the, um, the LAB. And on the left here, this is uh, basically from two different papers from Southampton Group. And you can see clear evidence for the base of a lithosphere outside of the rift, and then it becomes uh, absent. And you can see it's this blue anomaly here on the sides, and there's nothing really in, in the middle. So again, evidence of very sharp changes. And then the, the final technique is looking at anisotropy. And normally when we, we uh, look at um, uh, mantle anisotropy, we attribute it to the lattice preferred orientation of olivine associated with deformation of flow. But equally, we can be very effective in generating anisotropy if you have oriented melt. Um, and we can use techniques like shear wave splitting, the evidence of two independent shear waves to, to look for these methods. And the two models give us very different predictions of what the style of anisotropy would look like. But when we use conventional core phases like SKS, where we'd look at splitting, it's actually difficult to distinguish the two models. And the real um, uh, 
sort of nail in the, you know, what, what takes it home is really looking at surface waves, the horizontal waves propagating across, in this case, the main Ethiopian rift. And these results in conjunction with the SKF splitting really uh, uh, point the support, the, the, the magma uh, explanation for the anisotropy. And you can even see the orientation of the fast shear waves mimics the orientation of the magmatic segments through this, this area. And then more recently, uh, uh, James Hammond used a technique developed by James Wookie uh, for shear wave um, splitting tomography to divide, essentially uh, invert for different domains of anisotropy. And, and essentially what this paper shows is that that, that that broader low velocity region at a depth here of 300 kilometers can be explained by a uniform sort of blanket of anisotropy, which you can attribute to density driven flow moving towards Arabia. Uh, and above that is the, is the, the anisotropy that's associated with the magmatic segments and even the isolation of slivers of continent. And so what you end up with is by taking these, these, these uh, observations in, in conjunction, um, a picture of a stratified mantle beneath Ethiopia, this broad low velocity region of density driven flow that uh, produces this focused up wellings that cut into the crust and the lithosphere. And the melt focuses at plate boundaries and along the magmatic segments, which leads to these oriented pockets and sheets of melt. And even can explain the observations point towards uh, uh, slivers of continent being isolated. So the last bit I want to talk about is done by a fourth year um, uh, uh, student, MSI student at the University of Bristol, um, Kat uh, Dupre. And she essentially took the idea that if you have oriented, this is a map view, if you have oriented melt inclusions, the fast shear wave is polarized parallel to them and the slow is perpendicular. Um, but the slow shear wave, because it's cross-cutting the melt, should also be more attenuated. It should have more absorption of higher frequencies than the, the shear wave that polarized parallel. And this is a model for, this is vertically oriented melt pockets. And this shows QS1 is less attenuation in the fast and more in the slow. Um, but there's a crossover point. As the inclusions start to incline, um, you get the opposite effect, where the slower one shows less attenuation than the fast one. And the reason... I say that is because she obviously sees this in her observations. We use a method known as instantaneous frequency matching and we apply it to all the SKS phases. And so basically anywhere, here's the results on the right here. Uh, the orange circles are where we think the um, melt, where she thinks the melt inclusions are inclined greater than 60 degrees. Blue is where they're more vertical. And any of the small dots are where the um, differential attenuation is insignificant. And so most of them show that there is an inclined nature, or you would interpret it as an inclined nature to the melt distribution, but there are these pockets in between. And these, these actually, this is an earlier tomographic model from Ian Basto. And you, know, you can see where we've got this sort of very little uh, differential attenuation is the areas where there's very little anomaly and where the strong, we get stronger amounts of this attenuation than isotropy. So, so this is work still in progress, but it's yet another thing that's providing evidence. And it's very much agreement with uh, models uh, of Ben Holtzman and others that argue for uh, stress um, um, partitioning and melt segregation against impermeable marginal uh, LAB in this, in this case. So in conclusion, very quickly, what I've tried to show you, there's a diverse set of seismic observations that provide the fingerprint of magma assisted drifting. And obviously there's other geophysical observations such as MT that show this also. Um, localized upwellings from deeper uh, superplume thermally erodes the lithosphere along probably pre-existing sites of weaknesses or topographic highs. The decompression melting leads to magnetism and dike injection that weaks the lithosphere enough to facilitate rifting. And the strain is localized to plate boundaries rather than a whole wider zone of deformation. So it supports the magma system model as opposed to the, the stretching model. Uh, and I've already said this, the melt preferentially segregates. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Anybody wants to ask a question, then maybe you type it in the chat. Or if you're very quick, you can Oh, raise your hand doesn't work. You have to type it in the chat. Maybe I start with a question just to bridge the time. Uh, in Roger Buck's papers, they had these parameters where they could switch from magma assisted rift into purely tectonic rifting. Do you see any way to, to kind of get an observational handle on this type of parameter? Um, 
I guess in a sense, that's what I was trying to show is that uh, um, it's an indirect evidence, but the fact that the, the, the deformation is so, uh, so much more concentrated near the rift as opposed to, so for example, in the, in, in the, the stretching model, you'd expect a very gradational increase in, in, in crustal thickness moving away, whereas we see a very sharp boundary. So I, I think that, you know, it's indirect evidence supporting the magma model. Was that the sense of your question? Yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, we have one question from Richard Katz. Maybe Richard, you can ask it yourself if you unmute yourself. Hi. Um, hi, Mike. I was hi, Richard. Again. Uh, it disappeared. Um, I, I mean, I, what I was asking is that, all right, there's a lot of magma in Afar, but it's not a nascent rift. It's really well established. And it, it's probably, you know, uh, the dynamics are combining um, magmatism with tectonic stretching and so forth. But is there evidence in the region or elsewhere that uh, magmatism, early magmatism, magmatism is essential to initiate the rift? I mean, do you see that in any of the data that you've shown or other data? Well, the, the main Ethiopian rift is the youngest part. So, and, and there, that's where, um, for example, the highest anisotropy is, um, the biggest tomographic anomalies. And there's really clear sort of segmentation in that region too. So you're right, yeah, in the far it's more more developed. Um, but in in the main Ethiopian rift, I think yeah, there's evidence for it in the more nascent form. We have one question by, from Katie Baylor. Uh, could you ask it yourself, please? Yeah, I typed it because my um, internet's rubbish, so I missed a lot of the talk. But Mike, um, I know you were concentrating on the mantle in your talk, but do we know what happens to the melt in the crust? You know, how it's organized, where it resides, um, and what information could be used to investigate that further? Yeah, I think one of the big questions is how the, the mantle connects to the crust and the surface this expression of volcanism. That was why I was sort of intrigued with these observations that the anisotropy suggest the melt's inclined. And so maybe it's showing that it's actually already on a trajectory towards the, 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 you know, the, the um, axis of the rift. Um, and then obviously we could use more um, sort of tomography from local earthquakes or surface wave. Um, in fact, I, I should have referenced as a recent ambient noise paper that looks at this, but again, uh, the details of how sort of axial volcanism and magmatic segments are fed, I think is still still a bit unclear. And obviously MT is going to show that uh, equally, if not better. Uh, there are two more questions. There's one from Generator Manacha that I would like to postpone to the final discussion. And then uh, now one from Brendan Shook. And this would be the last one for this uh, talk. And then we switch to the next speaker. Brendan, could you ask it yourself? Yeah, thanks for a great talk. I was just wondering, a lot of the laboratory experiments have shown that the presence of melt can actually affect uh, the preferential alignment of olivine. And I was wondering if we have any field evidence that supports that, or if it's too non-unique that we think they're just uh, melt pockets and the background trend of uh, oriented olivine. Thanks. Yeah, I know that, that's a good question. And I, I sort of deliberately swept it under the carpet. Um, um, the, 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 I think the problem is, yeah, the, the olivine crystals would align um, in a direction perpendicular to what they would uh, without the melt segregation. Um, and uh, the problem is that would just enhance the signal of what we're looking at. So, so you're right, it is a bit of a, a non-unique problem. But when we've done modeling of the effects, the um, melt is so effective at generating anisotropy that I think seismically it's going to uh, dominate. 